Hello and welcome. As the health emergency has forced the country into a lockdown 3.0, the economic situation is getting worse. Slowing growth, income losses, job crisis. India is staring at its worst ever economic crisis, a possible emergency since 1991. Is there a roadmap ahead? What should be the road to economic revival? Joining us on the Corona Dialogues this weekend is a really heavyweight panel of some of the country's finest economic minds. Joining me from the United States, Dr. Arvind Subramaniam, former chief economic advisor. He was economic advisor to this government till a couple of years ago. Dr. Montek Singh Aluwalia, former deputy chairman planning commission, has been deeply involved in liberalization since 1991 in various capacities. Dr. Arvind Virmani is also a former chief economic advisor. We'll also be speaking to Dr. Kaushik Basu in a recorded interview. I appreciate all of you joining me here on the Corona Dialogues. I'm going to start by giving each of you a few minutes to tell us what you think is the roadmap. Why don't you talk, start, Dr. Subramaniam, you're joining us all the way from the United States. Tell us what you think is the roadmap ahead given the situation the country finds itself in at the moment. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot, Rajdeep, for having me. Um, I think all these discussions about, you know, roadmaps and things uh, should start with a kind of uh, shared recognition and understanding that one, you know, we're operating under conditions of great, great uncertainty, both on the, the health side and on the economic side. Uh, so, so one. And second, that really we should be, uh, uh, sh uh, you know, agree on the fact that, you know, in this situation, there are just, you know, a series of difficult and bad choices. There are no good choices, you know, lives, livelihoods. We've seen that whole debate. So I, I think it behooves us to have a certain amount of, you know, uh, humility and kind of modesty, uh, you know, when we kind of uh, approach these things, because there's just so much uh, uh, uncertainty and we're really in kind of very novel territory. Uh, that being said, I think that it's clear that uh, the consensus has moved that, uh, you know, developing countries like India, which have fewer resources, where maintaining social distancing is more more difficult, uh, where, where the, the, the devastation from lockdown is acute, that we should perhaps on balance err on the side of, of swifter and quicker exit from lockdown. And I think in some ways that's what, that's the debate now we're having in India, uh, quite rightly so. So the question really is, what are the principles, you know, we can talk about details later, mm -hmm. what are the principles that should guide the, this exit? And, and I would say, you know, broadly two, three, four, and then we can talk about that. One, I think, uh, you know, the, we should, you know, the European Union has this notion of subsidiarity. So, you know, decisions about exit from lockdown are going to involve complicated implementation and feasibility issues. So I think the balance needs to be struck on the one hand between subsidiarity, which is allowing those uh, parts of government, states and local bodies that are closest to the ground to make these detailed decisions on you know, the exit. And the center will have a role uh, in, in doing the things that affect all states and all local bodies. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, coordinating, say, uh, you know, the transfer of migrants back providing resources to the states, um, you know, uh, coordinating and ramping up, you know, the testing vaccine, uh, those aspects of, of the crisis. And I think what is now, you know, perhaps new is that we have now moved a little bit from, you know, uh, we know the growth consequences are going to be adverse. We know that fu fuel, fu I mean, food, cash, et cetera, uh, the, the stimulus probably has to be much bigger. I think now we're moving to a phase where we have to focus a lot on the production and financial side of the economy. How do you get credit uh, you know, back to all these enterprises? Mm -hmm. And also, how do we limit the losses, given that lots of enterprises are going to be affected by uh, uh, by what's happened. So these, I think, are, should be the broad principles, you know, guiding our uh, exit from the lockdown. Uh, I will stop and let uh, Montek and Arvind speak. I, I will sort of come to specifics in a moment with each of you, Dr. Subramaniam. You've laid a broad roadmap. 
Dr. Aluwalia, you want to pick up from where uh, uh, Dr. Subramaniam left? Your, uh, do you, what are the broad principles that you would follow at the moment, particularly given the constraints of this balancing act between lives and livelihoods? Even as we speak, the numbers keep going up day after day in terms of the deaths as well as the number of cases. Well, I think as uh, Arvind said, uh, first, I think we should recognize that there's a lot of uncertainty. I mean, how severe, uh, how fast the infection will spread, uh, what will be the extent of damage, which is a function of how long the lockdown continues. I mean, there's lots of uncertainty. I think it's generally agreed, by the way, that uh, we should have done a lockdown. Uh, it's now also agreed that there will be a staggered exit from it. Exactly how it will be done and the pace on which, at which it will be done, this is not known. And I think it would be a good idea if we could have some sense, perhaps the government could indicate, what are the criteria that will determine uh, the pace at which the relaxation will take place? You know, because remember, the logic of having the lockdown is simply that it will flatten the curve. In other words, it doesn't necessarily reduce the number of people who will be infected, but it stretches them out, and that enables you to get your health uh, infrastructure up in place mm -hmm. so that you can have a better outcome. I think it would be good to know how much has the health infrastructure actually been strengthened, how much more can be done. I know that many states have been doing this, but I don't have a global picture. You know, the other, other side of this balancing act, I mean, it's quite clear that the lockdown has led to a huge disruption. That will lead to a loss of growth. It will also lead to a loss of income. The loss of income will affect the poorest and the weakest sections most. And clearly, therefore, we need to compensate them. So on the financial side, mm -hmm. I mean, you've got, you've got two things you've got to do. I mean, one is what are the additional expenditures that we need to factor in into the budget uh, beyond what is already there? And I think the two areas that we have to focus on, one is clearly health infrastructure. I mean, we need to do whatever is necessary to bring the health infrastructure up to scratch as quickly as possible. Some of it will be long term, but some of it would be emergency measures to handle the crisis over the next several months. That's one. Second is we have to do more to provide income support to those who have lost their livelihood, mm -hmm. because for them, the loss of livelihood is very, very severe. So that's on the expenditure side. Now, you know, people worry about the fiscal deficit, and that's a legitimate worry. But, you know, I would say that uh, the real reason why the fiscal deficit is going to be exceeded is not the additional expenditure. You know, our ability to actually carry out additional expenditure is limited. Yes. And secondly, a lot of existing expenditure, there'll be savings because, you know, with all these lockdowns and uh, stoppage of construction, etc., a lot of expenditure that would otherwise have taken place will not be taking place. But what will happen is a massive loss of revenue, both for the center and for the state. Now, I mean, I've not seen any official figures, but many people argue that certainly for the central government, especially since there won't be any disinvestment mm -hmm. uh, worth speaking of in the current year, you could have a loss of revenues of almost 2.5% of GDP. So now the question is that this will expand the fiscal deficit, uh, even if we don't increase any expenditures. Uh, many people say they want a stimulus. Mm -hmm. It's not very clear mm -hmm. whether they would count this as a stimulus or whether they want a stimulus beyond uh, what what will happen to the fiscal deficit because of the loss of revenue. So this is an issue that really needs to be clarified. But, you know, whatever we do, I would say that the central government fiscal deficit, which is in the budget, 3.5%, that was an over-optimistic projection anyway. Uh, I think it might well go up to 55 or even 6%. So the real question you have to ask is, should you make a special effort to keep it lower Mm -hmm. or let the revenue uh, revenue loss lead to an expansion of the fiscal deficit and then do a correction next year. Now, my view is that's what we should do. Okay. So we should, we should not be trying to reduce the fiscal deficit as close as possible 
to 3.5 percent because there's a loss of revenue. Let you know, many people say that this will lead to negative effects internationally. You know, I feel that most international assessments of what is happening will take into account what is happening elsewhere. And I feel that if India can clearly say mm -hmm. that, look, we're mm -hmm. not going to cut expenditure to offset the decline in revenue, we will let the fiscal deficit rise, the government will borrow, and next year we'll try and bring this down. I mean, if we can convey credibility mm -hmm. in our commitment to bring it down over the next two years, I don't think people will mind the fact that we are expanding it in the current year. Now, one last point, and that is that many people, when they talk about the stimulus, are also talking about credit expansion. Now, technically, credit expansion is not stimulus. That's just a bank credit. The problem here is that I suspect that pure provision of liquidity by the Reserve Bank will not lead to an expansion in credit because the bankers perceive a lot of these loans as highly risky. They're not sure whether the companies that would be wanting to borrow or wanting to roll over will actually be able to repay the debts in future. And that is where I think you need a bit of fiscal support. I mean, either in the form of a government guarantee of a part of the credit or setting up an SPV, which is what the U.S. has done, where the Treasury sets up an SPV, the right. central bank finances it, and then this SPV buys up the loans that the, that the banks make. Now, you know, in the U.S., this SPV is going to buy up 95% of the loans that the, that the banks make. So most of the risk gets transferred out of the banks. And I feel that we need as early as possible to face this problem, take the bull by the horns and make it clear. See, let at the me, moment... I think let me take, RBI Dr. Aluwalia, you, you've set a template... You've said a template, you've raised various thoughts uh, in, in your opening remarks. Dr. Virmani, pick up from what you've heard from uh, uh, Dr. Montek Singh Aluwale, suggesting the time has come to take the bull by the horns. You're going to have to take major steps, some of which some would suggest are risky, but according to Dr. Aluwalia, unnecessary. So, uh, I, I think uh, we have to start by understanding what is so different about the pandemic of which lockdown is just one outcome. Mm -hmm. uh, to my memory or my study, there hasn't been a lo lockdown ever. I mean, in World War II, uh, uh, certain civilian production was forced to shift to wartime production, but there's never been a lockdown. And I'm not sure that everybody really understand what that means. So let's very quickly start with the pandemic in January. Uh, one of the things which was noticeable de there was that it was simultaneously a supply and demand shock. When you take uh, people out of work, there is no demand and there is no supply. Mm -hmm. Now, that is the background of the pandemic. And then you come to a lock. So, so the, the main uh, thing which was being felt in the rest of the world were two things, the supply chain disruption and this fear of contagion mm -hmm. in what might, what I call the contact sectors, people have different words for it. Of course, uh, uh, general public thinks of tourism, hospitality, travel, etc. Now, why contact sector? Because this whole problem is a fear of contagion. Now, that was already there. Now, as you said, many countries, including India, uh, thought that it was uh, they needed a lockdown to uh, flatten the curve. I think the key issue, I mean, from my way of looking at it, the main uh, objective of the lockdown, which I think it has achieved, is a kind of shock therapy. That is, I think they were irresponsible. I think on your program also uh, and other programs, irresponsible people who had caught the virus abroad but were not taking any precautions. Uh, I still remember this one case of a uh, rich guy who went off with the Bhutan, another fellow who went to Calcutta and so on. So uh, one purpose of the lockdown in India was this shock therapy mm -hmm. to make people aware of how serious the problem was. People like you and me and Montek and uh, others, uh, obviously uh, we, we think and analyze these things and, and we knew how serious it is, but uh, not everybody did. So. One was that shock therapy element. 
Now, you have to remember that the lockdown, uh, and this has implication, I'm not just doing it for theoretical purposes. The lockdown had one exemption, the essential commodities, right? Uh, we have estimated at the uh, Foundation for Economic Growth and Welfare that that uh, constitutes approximately 40% uh, of the GDP of India. Mm -hmm. The contact sectors, which I mentioned earlier, which anyway is going to be a problem even later, even when the lockdown is lifted, even six months from now, people are still, uh, with, e even when the ban is lifted, people are still going to fear traveling. People doesn't mean everybody, but let's say 50 to 75% of people. But the rest of the economy, which can be called uh, uh, manufacturing, mining, construction, and allied services, this it constitutes 50% of the economy, but it employs roughly, and the employment estimate is very rough, the GDP is more accurate, uh, roughly 35% of, of the workforce. So the essential commodities, uh, which is about 40%, right. employs 15% more than that, again, very roughly, 55 So actually, if you look at it in a macro perspective, the employment problem is less than the GDP problem. Now, what happens in a lockdown? In a lockdown, you've closed down 60% of the economy. That means there's no production, no sale, no income. So uh, to talk about, I, I think it's a, a, a misunderstanding to talk about a stimulus or otherwise in this phase of the economy. What you really have to focus on mm -hmm. is two important jobs. One is survival. I think a lot has been discussed, so I won't go into detail about that. Survival of humans who, who don't have the uh, financial savings to spend on essential commodities. Right. Remember, there's nothing else you can spend on. I, I, I still feel that when people discuss these issues, they, they don't seem to realize. So only thing which has to be spent on and can be spent on in a lockdown is essential commodities. So the only money you need is for your budget, which was the essential commodities, which I would say for the middle class is probably around 30%, right. for the poor it may be 50%. So the demand and supply is shut down, you give a stimulus of whatever kind, it has no effect. Everything is locked down, there is no alternative. And everybody is spending on essential commodities and presumably... So you're saying the stimulus can only come both, you're saying a stimulus coming. can come only once the lockdown is lifted. Yes, it has no meaning right now because it has no effect. You can't you can't stimulate a sector which by law is shut down. I mean, I, I find this a puzzle okay. that this simple element of lockdown people don't understand. Okay. And I'm sorry if I'm being a little loud about it, but a stimulus has no meaning when you're in the middle of a lockdown. It will have start meaning afterwards if right. and only enough production and supply and sales starts happening, Let then me, only it has a meaning, okay? It has okay. no meaning right point, now. Point right taken. now, what has meaning is two things which the government can and must do. One, ensure survival of the people who don't have and what's the second? savings uh, and, uh, and of course are out of second? income because it's shut down. 60% is shut down. So if they were getting income from that and they are not getting it now, they have to have a means to survive. And second is to make sure that uh, whole sectors, industries, etc., don't go bankrupt. Why? This is not social service. If 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 large sectors, uh, because of the lockdown or from other uh, silly policies of the government, like forcing them to pay 100% of wages to 100% of workers, if these companies go bankrupt, there will be no economy left to revive uh, six months from now. Okay. If huge elements of the the, the your points, your points are, are well taken. Because of the let, lockdown, let me, and because of other uh, policies, random policies by the state. Let me move on, Doctor Birwani. You made the point. You will have nothing to revive. Okay. You know, so that's so the first Rajdeep, major point I want to make. Yeah. Uh, no. Doctor Subramaniam. Let, 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 uh, let's move on. Let's give equal time. Let, let's get Doctor Subramaniam. Let's look at... Uh, uh, Razdeep, just to yes. build on, on, on a couple of things that uh, Montek said, uh, yes. one on the fiscal side and one on the financial side. Yes. Um, I, I think, remember what was uh, kind of a little bit uh, distinctive about the shock hitting India, that, you know, India 
the Indian economy was already weakening when this happened. So this was like a, a second shock, as it were, which is what I think has made the problem a, a little more uh, uh, acute than it otherwise would have been. So on the fiscal, uh, I think I don't quite agree with Montek that the only slippage you should allow is what will happen on the revenue side, because we know that there will have to be a lot more incremental expenditure, even after allowing for what Montek rightly says, some expenditures you cannot make. But even over and above that, you'd have to, you know, whatever the health expenditures are going to be, the cash transfers, the food transfers, the help. So, so I think the fiscal deficit will have to widen even more than what Montek is saying. But I do agree that uh, we have the space uh, provided, you know, Devesh Kapoor and I spelled out a menu of options for financing it. Uh, I think it, it's doable. And, you know, finally, the devastation The best is way to so finance huge. is Dr. Subramaniam. I saw yeah. the menu of options. What would, uh, because that is a big concern that where do you get the resources to finance, let's say, uh, yeah. Uh, the government's plans in a way to revive the economy, this sort of new deal. How do you raise, you've, you've given various uh, options. What would be the best according to you? No, I don't think we should rely on any one. I think we should rely on a, on a menu of options so that you don't strain any one part of the economy. Uh, I think, for example, one, I think there are lots of expenditures that can be cut. And you've seen already a number of state governments and central governments have said, for example, that, you know, uh, a wage and salary increases will be frozen. That's a source of saving. I think we can borrow money from abroad. Uh, which we've spelt out, including from NRIs and multilateral institutions. And I think we can, you know, uh, you know, borrow more from, from the public by issuing bonds. And I don't think at this stage we should rule out also, uh, you know, using uh, the central bank to finance, you know, to print money, to finance uh, responsibly uh, a part of what we're doing. Now, when, when I say this, people say, oh, my God, what will happen uh, you know, inflation will take off, take off, et cetera, et cetera. But I think uh, in all these things, look, we have to balance uh, the needs of the future and the fact that, you know, we cannot be seen to be, uh, you know, irresponsible. But I don't think, you know, this government or others has, you know, uh, has uh, uh, cannot credibly convey that go that what it will do in this period is one off and going forward it will be uh, you know conduct things responsibility so provided we have that i think all of these options cutting expenditures raising money from abroad uh, uh, raising money from the public by issuing government bonds and printing money all of these should be on the table mm -hmm. and one last point i think remember um, which gets forgotten in this is that the resources have to move to the states because they are in the front line of the the crisis, incurring many of the health costs uh, and the kind of, you know, dealing with migrants and so on. So I think the center should be uh, generous, uh, whether in terms of existing transfers, maybe allowing uh, the states to, to kind of have the central bank lending it money by printing money. I think getting money to the states is of the highest priority, whether it's, you know, the GST 14 uh, percent or, or, or uh, it, maybe the center should raise mm -hmm. money on behalf of the states. States should be allowed to uh, access the RBI. So that's, I think, on the whole fiscal side, I think we will need to do more than just what Montek was saying about allowing this. And there are ways of responsibly financing that. You know, you made a very important point, Dr. Subramaniam, because I spoke uh, earlier today and we'll carry that interview uh, at some stage with Captain Amrinder Singh. And he, the Punjab chief minister, said he didn't have the resources or the revenues uh, from the center to fight corona. Now, uh, Dr. Aluwalia, I know you're among the advisors to now the Punjab chief minister. Is that a worry? GST collections, we are told, at least conservatively will be down by 50% for the month of April. The center could well turn around and say, where do we get the revenues to give to the states? You, we are focusing at the moment possibly on a massive package for micro and small uh, enterprises. That's our focus. How do you raise the revenues at the moment to ensure that states have enough monies in hand to even pay salaries? Some chief ministers are saying they may not even be able to pay salaries next month. Well, as I said earlier, the revenue loss is going to be very large for the states. So there's no question <clears throat> that the states will be severely 
uh, restrained in terms of the resources they have. And if they don't get any other resources, there will be no alternative but to cut expenditure, whereas actually they are the frontline operators in fighting this COVID crisis. So there's no question in my mind that we should actually uh, take steps to provide more money to the states. Mm -hmm. That should really be done by the center, in my view. And the center should do it by raising its own, by raising the funds itself mm -hmm. and transferring them as a grant. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, the, the original idea was that the GST would grow at 14% per year. And if it didn't grow at 14% per year, the center would make up the difference. Now, this is not being done. So I think we should respect that. Remember, this is, I think, a one-year problem. Because you know, assuming that the uh, situation comes under reasonable control sometime during the year and that the lockdown gets relaxed, next year will be a completely different border. But for the current year, I think we have to see an increase in the center's fiscal deficit, mm -hmm. A, offsetting its own revenue loss, mm -hmm. B, providing grants to the states to offset the revenue loss that the states are experiencing, C, some additional expenditure on health and so on, which the center will be doing, may be offset by some uh, savings. Now, you know, uh, Arvind talked about borrowing money from abroad. Now, let me say, these are all rupee expenditures. I'm not totally convinced that it's a good idea to be borrowing money from abroad in dollar terms, mm -hmm. unless mm -hmm. you're going to borrow them at dollar interest rates, which are almost zero. Most of these NRI bonds end up being a dollar-denominated borrowing at very high interest rate. And I don't think that makes sense. So the bottom line is, can we finance the additional borrowing by, in effect, support from the central bank? Now, you need not call it monetizing the deficit because right. the central bank doesn't have to buy in the primary issue stage. I mean, if, if the central bank just picks up a lot of securities from the banks, it will create room for the banks to pick up the new uh, uh, bonds that are issued. So I think it will be monetary expansion. Yes, there is a danger of a little bit of inflation, but I don't see the alternative because, you know, if, if the states are going to lose 1% of GDP at mm -hmm. least, and the center is going to lose 2.5% of GDP, then unless somebody is saying that we should cut expenditure, Mm -hmm. by three and a half percent of GDP, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I mean, there is no alternative but to financing the debt and also monetizing it to the extent possible. You know, I, now, I think you need what you need here. Mm -hmm. And I, this is an important issue. I think Arvind made the correct point that, you know, when there's a lockdown and supply cannot be increased, the idea of stimulus being a demand uh, stimulus doesn't make sense. But the presumption is that the lockdown is going to end and if not in a few weeks, maybe in a month, those restraints are going to be removed. But, you know, you will find that the small and the medium enterprises will have taken a big hit. I mean, their revenues aren't there. Banks do not find them to be credit worthy. Many banks think that they will go bust. That would be a great mistake because, you know, the, the value of these enterprises as running enterprises is much more than the value of their assets. So we have to save the system by expanding credit, and therefore we need some reasonably clear fiscal support for this credit. You know, this is me, what all let, do. Let's, let me just pick up from yeah, that point. Yeah. Dr. Aluwala, let me yeah. put, uh, pick up from that point, because India's fiscal package of 1.7 lakh crores comprising direct income transfer and other measures, only 0.7% of GDP compared with 2.5% China, 8.9% US, 7.9% South Korea, 6.6% Brazil. Dr. Arvind Virmani, don't you think that the Indian government needs to also use this opportunity to protect particularly the micro and small enterprises? I know you're saying we are under a lockdown, but they are hurting. Many of them tell us that they do not have any incomes Therefore, they cannot even pay their employees' salaries for the month of April. Do they need protection or not? So, uh, yeah, okay. Let me try to be brief uh, because it's a very complicated subject and obviously we, we have to try and make it simple. But uh, first, uh, I reiterate what I said during the lockdown. The problem is bankruptcy. And I have seen no evidence that, uh, that there's an asymmetry in small firms being heard more or Right. more or less 
so the question the focus of government government does not have unlimited resources it has to focus on those sectors industries etc where there is a greatest danger of mass bankruptcy of firms so th there's no disagreement on that but the 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 reason is not because you have to provide a fiscal stimulus because you have to save the economy otherwise there'll be nothing left okay now let's go to uh, post lockdown very quickly i'll be quick in, in most of uh, q2 i'm talking on fy terms you're going to be in a transition the key problem believe me and that's why i'm drawing the focus is there are going to be localized areas of excess demand and excess supply it is not going to be an aggregate problem of excess demand or supply and the reason is because by its nature uh, you are doing an mm -hmm. uneven liberalization so in principle what my argument is that this mmc and ls sector should be liberalized just that part of it production sale of this sector should be liberalized as or, or freed as soon as possible because that will make sure that these local demand supply imbalances don't happen mm -hmm. the rest of it the social uh, uh, distancing physical distancing for societal purposes and those uh, right. sectors which i uh, uh, contact sectors which i said can come later but this one has to go as quick as possible now now we come to let's say q3 or q4 yes the traditional macroeconomic issues of stimulus excess demand except supply will come back in, into focus but uh, you have to be very careful about when you talk about uh, employment generation and all the key problem as i said is that they have to be firms surviving to be able to hire them no? so the survival part is very very important it is not traditional that's what i'm trying to emphasize the pandemic crisis and the lockdown is very different from but the most firms crisis. today don't okay. have the liquidity so to survive what do we do uh, most in, firms the smaller firms tell me they don't have the liquidity to survive if this continues for a month longer yes the survival is an issue so you focus on whoever is the area which is as i said i am not saying that msmes are not in trouble yeah. what i am saying is i have not seen any evidence that is asymmetric okay. that msmes are more in trouble than larger firms large firms in the contact sectors will go bankrupt airlines okay. will be completely bankrupt so can i i'm not saying that specific so, areas are not so you are saying stress. survival you are so saying the I'm first first task of the government macro approach to fiscal will not work okay. you have to go down to micro you have to find the industries and areas uh, would you where, okay uh, this point taken would you would you therefore say problem, would you therefore say dr and direct okay, your money taken, and sir. credit to those areas dr subramaniam taking off from that would yeah. you focus on certain areas dr subramaniam areas <laughs> which, <laughs> which are high growth <laughs> areas <laughs> dr subramaniam that will lead to yeah. you know job creation is a major challenge how is yeah. that or, or at least saving jobs do you believe we focus on certain areas particularly in this first phase as we try to in some way emerge out of a lockdown see i, I think uh, uh, you know rajdeep the first order of business has to be to get credit flowing into the economy because that's the way you if they survive if all the enterprises big and small the more of them survive the more you minimize the job losses the costs the gdp growth so i think you know uh, getting that credit flowing uh, to these firms is very important now th th the dilemma is this rajdeep huh? is that it's not as if the central bank has not been providing ample liquidity the problem is that banks are flush with money but are not willing to pass that on to the enterprises that need the credit so you have to ask why is this paradox of plenty of liquidity but no credit actually going to the final borrower there are two reasons for that one i think is uh, you know what montake mentioned i think there has to be maybe more much more of uh, fiscal support i think perhaps the banks will have to be recapitalized if they think that that's what's preventing them from taking on more risk but i think the second part of the problem is a real anxiety and a risk aversion on the part of the banks because remember 
even before we went into the crisis, uh, Josh Feldman and I wrote that you know we had four a four balance sheet problem. Now we have maybe many many more balance sheets that are impaired. Part of the reason is that bankers are very afraid to make these loans, even in normal times. And now in these difficult times, you know, they're going to be ultra uh, paranoid and ultra prudent uh, before making these loans. So we have to have some way of the for the government to say that loans made now, you know, the, the government will bear the ultimate risk, mm -hmm. but also uh, the decision makers for these loans will be protected from you know, action subsequently. I think uh, that's, I think, a very important part, which I think we shouldn't overlook. And I think that the, 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 the final thing, which I think we haven't given enough uh, attention to is, there are going to be a bunch of firms who were otherwise viable, but because of the Corona crisis have been hit. We need some special mechanism to say, look, this was a shock for which you were not responsible. We will give you haircuts or whatever, reduce your debt so that you can move on as quickly as possible. So I think we need uh, some new mechanism apart from ensuring the flow of credit, also for allowing those that have been adversely effective to kind of shed their losses, shed some of their debt and move on to go on to become, because that's the way to protect jobs and employment and activity in the economy. You know, I, uh, we have two chief former chief economic advisors with us. I also spoke to a third, Kaushik Basu, yesterday. I just want you all to hear what he said because I think he reflects on a problem uh, that perhaps many fear that as we try to emerge out of this lockdown, will we end up with license permit Raj 2.0? Just listen in to what Dr. Basu said and I'll get then Dr. Aluwalia to respond. There are some rules which are special to the COVID which will be there. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, you want, want to unshackle. I mean, in Bombay, you have rules like two people in a car will be allowed. I, I don't quite understand if from a household where four people are staying together, if four of them who are in a room in a household get into a car in a household, why have that additional rule for them? So bring the rules down minimally. Trains open up trains with lots of special rules. You will have to have there about how many people can sit in a compartment, etc. But beyond that, don't strangle because India has a history of license permit Raj. We are prone to that. And the world has examples from around, you know, China 1978. It was if Deng Xiaoping did not have the wisdom to realize that the over control from the top you need to remove, China would not be the economic boom story that it became subsequently. It happened because Deng Xiaoping decided that some of the powers that were there in the government it's worth giving up those powers. We must not go in the opposite direction. You know, as you hear Dr. Basu there, Dr. Aluwalia, as someone who was part of the team that took us out of license permit Raj in the early 90s, do you fear in a way that lockdown 2.0 or 2.3.0 is leading to excessive rule making? You know, companies complain that they don't want to start their industries because they fear that there is some bureaucrat watching over them, whether adequate number of workers have come, are the transport rules being followed, or are these only temporary pains in your view? No, I, I think what Kaushik is saying is absolutely right. There is, in my view, a very serious danger that the shift to centralized control will in fact bring back all kinds of detailed regulation. In a way, uh, Arvind Ramani is saying we must go into each uh, sector and each uh, uh, stressed area and decide how much credit must go, et cetera. In my view, is not the right way of going about it. You know, uh, some, of the, some of the statements that have been made, for example, that we're gonna allow production to take place, which is good, but uh, the unit concern must ensure that there's adequate social distancing within the unit and that people are housed within the unit. Now, you know, this is virtually not, this is simply not workable. Mm -hmm. And what will happen is even if it is observed with the best intentions of the, in the world, somebody will be able to find some violation somewhere. Most of these guidelines are so vague that if you really want to hold someone responsible, you can. So I'm not sure how we handle it. If, if one can have a very clear understanding that all this is going to be removed as soon as the lockdowns are over, and if you're also very clear that the lockdowns will be over in two weeks or three weeks or four weeks, 
then it's only a four week problem and we get back to where we were earlier in that four week we could handle it better we could handle it worse right but it's very very important to keep in mind that the reintroduction of the license permit raj will be the death knell of any effort to revive growth in the country are, and it will have very very serious consequences kashik basu is right mm -hmm. many other people have said the same thing and i, I do worry about it dr virmani do you worry about it that maybe the the nature yeah, of this I, I lockdown think, uh, is pushing us into putting up more rules said, more regulations which might stifle policy. industry sorry fiscal expenditures is always specific there is no general fiscal expenditure there is an automatic stabilizer which is the tax revenue collection goes down that provides an automatic stimulus but every expenditure is specific and that's what i was referring to uh, what i am saying is there's no point di uh, di uh, discussing in abstract whether x country is doing 5% y is doing 10 uh, z is doing 15 and we should do uh, 10 or 15 mm -hmm. what i am saying is that expenditure has to be focused on specific objectives of saving sectors and industries from bankruptcy as far as credit is concerned it's very clear mm -hmm. the, the we have liquidity uh, my uh, namesake is quite uh, correct and many others have noted that the way to solve that and i happen to have <laughs> my my one of two of my initial papers and thesis are on credit by the way and the one i discovered that the best uh, approach is credit guarantees so government no it is doesn't should not direct credit as uh, monteco saying i am saying no i'm not saying that credit guarantees sharing of risk by the central government is the best way for government to intervene there for example for msmes if there is enough liquidity but credit is not going there put up some kind of a risk sharing scheme a credit right. guarantee by the central government and uh, the the banks will still have to evaluate can i similarly if it's not going to nbfcs you can have another uh, uh, some kind of a risk sharing credit guarantee scheme so that the banks will lend now you... having said that uh, uh, i i I'm... absolutely agree that the solutions going into the quarter four and i want to just very quickly give you three because uh, uh, you know and and they they have to do with uh, beyond uh, this specificity which i mentioned you have to do general tax reform and expenditure reform because generally we talk about uh, revenue neutral tax reform whether it's the gst or the direct tax code or the income tax right in this current situation i would say the best way to provide a stimulus is revenue redu reducing uh, uh, tax reform which means that in the short time you short term you deliberately do not try to match uh, and make it revenue neutral you be generous because in the medium to long term the buoyancy will increase etc if you have your second point right, whether it's gst or dct and similarly on expenditure what i recommend again this trade off between short and long term is is to uh, combine all the subsidies and institute a direct cash transfer right now Uh, can i which is also a little more generous than you would think of in normal times can i and 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 why is this important the pandemic actually has revealed why it's so important because everybody refers to specific groups you you are all you you have referred to it all the economists on your show have referred to it that okay it's the hawkers or the self employed well how do you give them uh, money how do you make sure they survive you use the aadhar system you have a direct cash transfer if you had it in place now you would have been able to direct whatever funds they need right well, we there su we are supposed you have to, to have them. we are supposed to and, have that system and it's not so difficult i through think the jam trinity through jan jan dhan aadhar and mobile months. we are supposed right to have enough to pass those transfers but i want to as we approach the end i want to know whether you see opportunities and i want to start yeah. with you dr subramaniam do you see opportunities because you know at the moment it appears a dark tunnel it appears that you know the economy as global economies are facing as as economies across the world are facing is facing a potential recession do you see any light at the end of the tunnel dr subramaniam uh, see uh, uh, i think in fact uh, uh, devesh kapoor and i think there are several opportunities uh that the crisis creates um uh, just to give you one example an idea that we had was remember that 
Uh, one of the achievements was this, of this government was to create the kind of jam plumbing uh, to facilitate the direct cash transfers. You know, that plumbing needs to be completed uh, and this crisis provides an opportunity to do that so that eventually we can transition into something like a universal basic income with, you know, a whole new set of taxes on wealth and property. I think that's one big opportunity. The, the second big opportunity is really, you know, India used to be a, a major producer of, of uh, pharmaceuticals, you know, the active ingredients. Now the world over, we're going to realize that, you know, the dependence on other countries for these things it maybe is a bit risky. And why not rehabilitate that, uh, uh, you know, strength that we had in the past, re-energize and maybe create a, a pharmaceutical. And even today, Harish Damodaran has a very good piece saying even the pesticide sector, yeah. there's a lot of opportunity there as well. A last one, I would say, which I think the crisis has shown that you know, both that Indian migrants are terribly important for the Indian economy, but also that they're very vulnerable when things go bad. I think a big opportunity will be, how do we recreate the architecture for migration in the country so that we continue getting the benefits and dynamism from the migration? Because we don't want migration to come down, but at the same time, ensuring that you know, the social safety net also applies to them in times of crisis. So these are, I think, three amongst many opportunities that the crisis creates. Montek Singh Aluwalia, 30 seconds. I'm sorry to bring it down, uh, a conversation where I've, which we've, you know, had to bring down to the final 30 seconds. But do you have a 30 second uh, suggestion for an opportunity that exists out there? You know, there are many opportunities, but I, I think one of the most important right now is because I think we're going to have to tolerate a much higher fiscal deficit than most people would like for the current year. We need to persuade the rest of the world that we're going to bring this down. And the only way we can bring this down is if we do a better job of tax collection. Now, you know, it's well known that India's total tax to GDP ratio is about five to six percentage points lower than it should be. Now, it can be brought to that level if we bring about a structural tax reform, mm -hmm. both direct taxes and indirect taxes. I am not at all in favor of knee-jerk reactions. Quite honestly, this is not something that has to be announced now, but I think if the government were to set up a really high-level committee which brings forward all the different proposals for fuller discussion so that in the next budget, you can actually do a tax reform. I think that would be a great opportunity. And the, frankly, the crisis is staring us in the face. People are going to ask, you're going to raise the debt to GDP ratio. What are you going to do next year? And the only credible answer that we have is that, look, we are bringing about major tax reform. That would include, by the way, reform of the GST which, as you know, there are many, many things that need to be done. But it's a great opportunity to get it right. done now. And even the announcement that we intend to do it, and sort of like was done in 1991 by setting up the Chelaya Committee, it would focus attention on the issues, and it would be a transparent way of discussing all these issues, right. rather than simply sort of outlining them and unveiling them at the time of the budget. You know, I, I want to thank all of you for for speaking your mind, speaking so articulately. Maybe it's time for a new deal. That's the way to press put it. Maybe this is a time and a crisis provides an opportunity for a new deal. All three of you have illuminated us with your thoughts. Thank you very much for joining us on the Corona Dialogue. Dr. Subramaniam, Dr. Aluwalia, Dr. Virmani, appreciate your joining us. We've run completely out of time. Thanks for watching the Corona Dialogue.